ladies and gentlemen, could I begin this evening's proceedings with just a few announcements that I'm sure will interest you. I'd like first of all to draw your attention to the current issue of the Age Monthly Review in which there is a paper written for that review by Colin Wilson. The title of that paper is The Intentional Arrow and I commend it to you. The current issue of the Age Monthly Review is on sale in newsagents. Secondly, I'd like to advise you that on Monday, Colin will be recording for the ABC a program for the book program series, and in that program he will be interviewed by Professor Max Charlesworth, the noted existentialist. And I, for one, am greatly looking forward to the dialogue between Max Charlesworth and Colin Wilson. Thirdly, can I advise you that Colin will be making only one other public appearance in Melbourne, and indeed in Australia, during this visit, he will be speaking at the Northcote City Library in Separation Street, Northcote, on Monday evening at approximately 7.15. Can I introduce to you now the Honourable Mr Justice McGarvey, Chancellor of La Trobe University. Vice-Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it is with a real sense of delight that I rise to uh, introduce uh, Colin Wilson. Colin Wilson is a man of many dimensions. He's a man of the world. He started life as a laboratory assistant. He uh, uh, went into the uh, uh, Royal uh, Air Force. He uh, progressed to becoming a navvy, he became a boot and shoe operative, he became a dishwasher, and he became a plastic moulder. Then, rather in the uh, way of George Orwell, he went to Strasbourg and Paris, and uh, he learnt uh, more life in those parts. He uh, returned to dishwashing, and uh, then he, uh, <coughs> he started writing. His first publication, The Outsider, uh, was published in 1956. Uh, somewhat to his surprise, uh, it uh, was greeted by a blast of critical acclaim. It happened that during the same week that it was published, uh, John Osborne's play, Look Back in Anger, had been reviewed and uh, the two events were associated and uh, within the next week J.B. Priestley uh, writing in the New Statesman invented the, new, the term angry young men and so in particular the angry young men were identified uh, <coughs> with, uh, with Colin and uh, John Osborne. They were regarded as being the leaders of what was indeed a new literary movement. By 1967, he was visiting professor at the University of Washington. I won't go through all his publications or all his successes. He has had his uh, publication, his book Life Force, filmed in Japan, and his writings are extremely uh, popular in Japan. In 1984, he wrote The Criminal History of Mankind. He is one of the most prolific writers whose works are being published today in the English-speaking language. I should add that they are being published in 32 languages. His, uh, we are fortunate that uh, some of his books are available at the table outside the lecture theatre tonight and uh, he is prepared to uh, autograph uh, books which are purchased. I don't wish to give the impression that he only works and writes. He lists as his uh, leisure activities the curious combination of music, mathematics and wine in that order. But I think that it is as a cultural influence 
on his time that Colin Wilson uh, is, uh, is, is best known. In 1966, he wrote the book, The New Existentialism, and he might be summed up as a man who is brimming with interest in people, in their thought, in their philosophy, and in their potential. His dominant theme, which he's able to place before millions by his attractive form of writing, is that of the full realisation of human potential. There is no more staunch opponent in the modern world of pessimism and defeatism. He regards gloom and doom as the uh, enemy of mankind and womankind reaching their potential. He uh, has the view that human consciousness can lift itself, that it can grasp optimism, happiness, confidence and thus potential. We are indebted for the fact that the first occasion on which Colin uh, Wilson has uh, visited Australia is uh, this occasion and the first address which he is giving is given at La Trobe. We owe that to Howard Dosser. Howard Dosser, as many of you know, is a man of letters within our university. He's council executive officer. He is uh, a, a, a poet of some note, and it's been my good fortune to read quite a bit of his poetry. He first read John. Uh, he first read uh, Collins book, The Outsider, and he realised what potential this author had. I don't need to tell an audience of Victorians how important it is to have effective seekers. Victoria, whose prosperity was first built on gold, started by uh, finding nuggets. But the real wealth came from those who systematically looked at the deeper veins and uh, brought them to the community wealth. Howard Dosser did that. Howard realised that while there were the, the nuggets, the published and famous books, there was a great deal of uh, Colin Wilson writing in magazines and journals. In 1983, he approached Colin and asked him could he publish uh, uh, those articles. And with accustomed uh, modesty, Colin thought that no publisher would be interested. With accustomed persistence, Howard uh, prepared uh, the work known as the Bicameral Critic. Within a week he had a publisher and it was a great success. He is working now on a further selection which has the title of tonight's address, The Untethered Mind. He is also working on uh, an analysis of Colin's work generally. I think it's most appropriate that the first lecture in Australia should be given at La Trobe University because there are basic qualities of La Trobe University which are qualities in common with Colin Wilson. La Trobe University is a university which believes that it can grasp opportunity, that it can build its confidence, that it can increase its potential, and uh, a university which does so. I can think of no better campus there is for the inaugural uh, lecture in Australia uh, by Colin Wilson, and it is with great pleasure I now invite him to address us on the topic, The Untethered Mind. Another thank you very much.
Oh, that's lovely. Thank you, Harry. Well, I feel very privileged indeed to be here. I'm here by accident because somebody rang up my wife and said, would we go to Japan with all expenses paid? And um, the offer was too good to refuse, and I thought Australia was about 100 miles from Japan. <laughs> so I rang Howard and said, you know, we can come to Australia. And uh, I must say, you know, I've enjoyed it immensely since I've been here. I feel completely and totally at home. Uh, what I want to say, I've uh, been saying for the past 30 years, so it's going to be a little difficult uh, to summarize it in the seven hours we have available to us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm going to briefly um, summarize the uh, basis of um, my ideas. I'll try to do that in a, a quick five minutes because I've been talking ever since I came here and I have this horror of repeating myself. You know that uh, in 1956 I produced my first book, The Outsider, which was basically about a very simple thing. That is, that certain people experience moments of tremendous happiness and affirmation, moments of vision, in which they feel that the whole universe is a completely wonderful place, and that seem, in these moments, to make the moments of boredom and defeat and triviality, which compose most of our lives, to be unimportant. Unfortunately, these moments last only briefly, and as often as not, when you try to remember what they were about the following morning, you're inclined to dismiss them as, you know, the effect of drinking too much or, you know, simply of an overflow of energy. Now, it seems a strange thing to say, but th this thing did not start until the early 19th century, or maybe 30 years before that. In the 18th century, it doesn't seem to exist. Uh, they liked landscape gardens and they thought that mountains and lakes were boring. And it wasn't until the early 19th century that you suddenly had people like Goethe and Schiller and Wordsworth and Shelley and Byron and so on suddenly feeling in these curious moments of intensity that life is entirely delightful and that man is in some paradoxical sense a god. This lasted until about 1850, and then suddenly the Romantics began to feel it was all a big mistake. And you got a sort of steady downhill tendency until the end of the century, when the whole thing seemed to turn into total misery. So that by the 1890s, with the decadence, they seem to have this feeling that the human spirit may have these moments of tremendous intensity, but it's like... Uh, it's like a spark attempting to burn underwater, like an oxyacetylene torch, which is powerful enough to resist the, uh, the pressure of the water for a short time, but sooner or later, the water will close in and put it out. And so, romanticism died out by about the year 1900. Now, this was what I wanted to write about, because for me, these moments of tremendous happiness were somehow the fundamental question of my own life. As a small boy, I'd always noticed at Christmas time this wonderful bubbling feeling of tremendous happiness and always the feeling that somehow this was true. This was basically true. And that if only you could grasp the trick of it, then you should be able to, to reproduce it at any time of boredom during the rest of the year. Well, when I discovered the Romantics in my teens, it seemed to me that maybe the whole thing was a tragic mistake because the Romantics achieved their moments of intensity by dreaming, by turning their back on the real world. 
and that perhaps only the dreamers were the people who achieved these moments of ecstasy and intensity and that they did so at the expense of their own lives. So many of those people I wrote about in The Outsider committed suicide or died insane or died of tuberculosis. And someone like Van Gogh painting his starry night with these terrific whirls of vitality in the sky nevertheless committed suicide and left a note saying misery will never end. This, you know, for me was the great paradox. Well, uh, briefly, when I'd written the book about this basic problem, I then came across the work of Abraham Maslow, this American psychologist who wrote to me um, from Brandeis University in Massachusetts, um, in which he said that he decided to study healthy people and because he got sick of studying sick people because sick people talked about nothing but their sickness and he decided that no one had ever decided what healthy people felt and thought and so he got together the healthiest people he could find and talked to them about their health and what he discovered was surprising that all healthy people had with a fair degree of frequency what he called peak experiences that they all had these strange experiences often several times a day just sudden you know <laughs> isn't life wonderful of this bubbling terrific happiness now what was interesting was that as soon as he began to talk to his students about peak experiences they began remembering peak experiences they'd had in the past but had taken for granted and then when he went further into this he discovered that his students began having peak experiences all the time because they were now thinking and talking about peak experiences the peak experience in itself seemed to produce this <laughs> this tendency to turn in the right direction so to speak and that for me was the really interesting thing and that's what all my work has been about ever since then well that's the summary that's taken me in the first five minutes now I talked about the rest of it last night so I'm going to skip that and anybody who wasn't here last night <laughs> but what I want to get into is the next interesting and important discovery I made I realized that in certain moments we experience with great intensity flashes of reality from the past I'd experienced these things myself. Uh, for example, the smell of coffee being ground would always back, bring back to me with tremendous intensity a particular place in my hometown, Leicester, in the Midlands, in the corner of the marketplace, and somehow bring back the whole of the period when I first went to secondary school at the age of 11. I discovered that, you know, the classic example of this occurs in Proust's novel, um, Recherche du Temps perdu. The, the remembrance of things past and that in the first volume the essential episode is the episode in which as an adult Marcel goes home and is offered by his mother a small cake called a madeleine and a bit of herb tea as he dips the madeleine in the herb tea he suddenly says uh, I ex a, a curious pleasure invaded my senses. I suddenly ceased to feel mediocre, accidental, mortal. And as this feeling of exquisite pleasure invaded the senses, he thought, why am I feeling this? What's it all about? And then he tasted the Madeleine for a second time, and gradually it came back to him that when he was a child in a little village called Combray, whenever he came in from school, his aunt gave him a madeleine, or, or a bit of her madeleine, dipped in her herb tea, and it suddenly revived with total reality the whole of his childhood. Now, this sounds an absurdity, because he knew he was a child in Combray. Why should tasting a biscuit dipped in tea give him this feeling of exquisite pleasure and of ceasing to be mediocre, accidental, mortal. The obvious reason is that in a sense we know that we were children and yet we don't believe it. It's not a reality to us. G.K. Chesterton once said, we say thank you when someone passes as the salt, but we don't mean it. 
We say the earth is round, but we don't mean it even though it's true. But an astronaut in space can say the earth is round and mean it. And at these, it's these moments when you can say something and mean it that suddenly awaken inside you this immense flood of basic optimism. That's, that's the nature of the peak experience. This seemed to me to be the basic vital clue. You see, what I wanted to know was this. How could you reproduce the peak experience at will, whenever you wanted to? If we've got this inside us, and it was, <laughs> it's as if Bruce touched a button and something happened. And you notice what he says, I had ceased to feel mediocre, accidental, mortal. In other words, that feeling of being an ordinary human being trapped within your ordinary present triviality, that seemed to disappear. In some curious way, we are told the truth by these moments of intensity. That's what I determined in The Outsider. They are truer than our ordinary feeling of mediocrity of being confined by the present moment. So, the basic question was, in that case, how can you get back to them? That, that was the question of all my work. See, think of this. Here's, here's a kind of parable. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are sitting on either side of the fire in Baker Street on a foggy November morning and Watson has read the times from beginning to end and he's totally bored and scarcely able to exert himself. He says to Holmes, I see that Lord Mancroft is dead, Holmes. Did you ever happen to meet him? And Holmes says, as a matter of fact, Watson, that was the beginning of one of the most bizarre cases of my whole career. Would you like to hear about it? And instantly, Watson is wide awake. <coughs> now, you would say, of course he is, because Holmes has produced this by saying that. But is this true? What happened is at the moment Holmes said, as a matter of fact, Watson, Watson pushed a button in his chest so, or in his head, and suddenly he was wide awake. Watson did it himself. And that's the interesting thing. Think of this question. Why doesn't it tickle when you tickle yourself? If you think about it, the answer is obvious. Think of tickling a baby. Before your hands reach the baby, the baby's already screeching with laughter. The baby is tickling itself. And of course, when you tickle yourself, you know it's you, so it doesn't tickle. So the answer to the question is that when somebody else tickles you, you tickle yourself. And when you tickle yourself, you don't tickle yourself, which is why it doesn't tickle. <laughs> You do it yourself. And Watson does it himself as soon as Holmes says, would you like to hear about it, Watson? In some strange way, that faculty that Proust discovered when he tasted the biscuit dip dipped in tea is produced by us. We can do it. And this was the point about Maslow's peak experience. Now, when I talked about Maslow, to talk to Maslow about the peak experience, I said, surely it should be possible to produce these at will. And Maslow said, nope, impossible. They come when they want to and they go when they want to and there's nothing you can do about it. He said, as soon as you try willing it, it just goes away. Uh, you know the way that this happens. If you actually try hard to remember something, it just doesn't work. Um, relax and suddenly it comes wandering into your head. This is obviously one of the peculiarities of the human mind. And yet, it struck me that this business of being able to conjure up the past with such intensity is a basic faculty which we all possess. Arnold Toynbee described climbing Mount Tegetus in Greece above the plain of Sparta and reaching the ruined citadel of Mystra where 200 years before barbarians had invaded 
and destroyed the citadel and it had been a ruin ever since. And he said, Is it, as he was sitting there, eating a bar of chocolate, staring down on the plain of Sparta, it suddenly hit him with total intensity that 200 years ago barbarians came over that wall there and it was as if it was real and quite suddenly he said he had this feeling of the total reality that had destroyed Mistra. And he explains that this led him to write this enormous ten volume study of history. And he describes ten more experiences in which the same thing happened to him. These experiences of the total reality of other times and other places. Now if you think about it, we know that other times and other places were real. And yet, we have this curious incapacity to grasp it, even our own lives. And yet, the power is in there. How do we do it? If Maslow was right, we can't do it. There's no way in which by willpower alone or by conscious will, you can actually evoke the past or summon these moments of intensity. Now, I found that this didn't satisfy me at all. I could see clearly that it should be possible to somehow evoke these moments if only we could discover this curious key which appears to involve in some funny way <laughs> a sort of negative movement of the will. That is to say, uh, you suddenly relax into the intensity instead of sort of overdoing it. And this was my second major clue. Uh, you all know about this, but I'm going to have to tell you about it um, anyway. That is to say that in the 1930s, it was discovered that you have two people living inside your head, one in the left and one in the right hemisphere of the brain. They discovered that, you know, you know if you took the top of your head off, it, your brain would look like a walnut joined by a kind of little bridge down the middle. <clears throat> the bridge is called the corpus callosum. They discovered that if you split this bridge of nerves which joins the two halves of the brain, you turn literally into two different people. One of the odd things that nobody knows is why we've got two brains, because the two halves of the brain are mirror images of the other. Nobody knows why we have literally two brains. One of them said maybe it's a spare in case you know, one, one of them goes out of action. Um, and again, we don't know why we have this funny kind of bridge joining the two halves of the brain in the middle. Somebody said, well, it's to stop the brain from sagging in the middle. But they discovered that you could cut the brain down the middle and cure epileptic attacks. And it was quite some time, it appeared to make no difference whatsoever to the patient when they did this, it was quite some time before they noticed that when they did this, the person turned into two people. For example, one split-brain patient was trying to um, zip up his flies with one hand and trying to unzip them with the other. Another split-brain patient was trying to hit his wife with one hand and the other was holding it back. Uh, people who bang, uh, incidentally, one of the odd things about the two halves of the brain is that for some reason the left side of the brain controls the right side of your body and the right side of the brain controls the left side of your body. And this applies um, basically to your eyes as well. They discovered that if a patient banged into something with the left side of his body, he didn't notice the bang. Obviously, it was connecting, you know, up to the other side of the brain, and somehow that side was just no longer registering. If you showed a patient an apple with the left eye and an orange with the right eye, and you said, what have you just seen? Um, he would reply, an orange. If you said, write with your left hand what you've just seen, he would write apple. If you said, what have you just written? He would reply, orange. If you showed the same patient a dirty picture with his right brain, he would blush. If you said, why are you blushing? He would say, I don't know. Literally two people living inside your head in the left and right hemispheres, and one of them is a total stranger. And the one who lives on the other side 
is in the left side, that is, is you, the person you call you. Now, there was another very interesting clue. Um, in the 1930s, a brain physiologist called Wilder Penfield discovered when he was doing a brain operation um, in which the patient can remain awake because the brain has no feeling. He discovered that when he touched the temporal cortex with an electric probe, suddenly the patient remembered in total detail a conversation with his mother in his childhood. Not just a vague conversation, but the exact precise detail of every single word and feelings and everything and, um, you know, the smell of the kitchen, and the house, and the traffic going past outside, everything. Just like Proust. And he, Proust had written a 12-volume novel to attempt to reinduce these peculiar feelings. If he'd met Wilder Penfield, he wouldn't have had to. He just had a brain operation. <laughs> Penfield discovered that whenever he did this, touched the, the temporal cortex with an electric probe, it appeared to bring back a total flood of memories from the past in the most minute and precise detail exactly like a video recording with smells and tastes involved now you can see that this means that inside your head you have got stored every single experience of your whole life which is an absurdity because in that case, how can we get bored? You ought to be able to take, as it were, a video recording of your childhood off the shelf whenever you have nothing else to do and replay it. Why have we got all these video recordings inside our heads which we never use, which we die leaving to rot? It's an absurdity. Why are they there? Why has the brain recorded everything that has ever happened to you? including even things that you've heard quite unconsciously. Other experiments have shown that people have spoken foreign languages which they've heard accidentally in childhood from someone else and never consciously recorded. Even Samuel Taylor Coleridge recorded a case of this as early as 1810. So, it seems obvious that we have these enormous capacities insiders which Proust had stumbled upon and which Toynbee had stumbled upon and which we don't know how to control so why are they there what are we doing with them now the answer obviously has to be something to do with human evolution itself and it was only sort of fairly late on that I began to realize just how far they had developed over the course of our evolution. You see, when life started on Earth, there was no death whatever. All living creatures simply split into two, and they did not die off in our normal sense of the word. There was no individual death. <coughs> At some point in its history, life invented death. There's no reason why it should have invented death, unless there was some positive motive so to speak. What was that positive motive? It was because life until then had been going on for about a quarter of a billion years with absolutely no change whatsoever. In other words, it seems possible that the motivation behind this change was the desire for change. I use motivation and I realis realize scientists will be horrified at this word. <coughs> They'll say, you know, there's no such thing as motivation when you're talking about life, it all happens automatically. Teleology, you know, you're not allowed to use this. But in fact, this does appear to be the fact. You see, a creature swimming around in a sort of um, plasmic soup and simply absorbing other creatures has no need for memory it had n has no need to do anything but eat and then it splits into two and one half withers away and yet the whole thing is still contained in the half that remains no need for change everything goes on the same for all eternity <coughs> 
As soon as death entered the world, then these creatures suddenly needed, to some extent, to have memory, because they were no longer eternal. They had, when a thing was born, so to speak, it had to remember its own past. And suddenly you had an extra element in life. Life, instead of being just a unity, had to become a kind of duality, two things. Memory on the one hand, and just ordinary existence on the other. Now, as life continued, once again, there was a kind of balance. But what began to emerge eventually was a third element called consciousness. And suddenly there was something new in the history of life on Earth. These things were able to some extent to anticipate the future because that is the only purpose of consciousness. There's no point in being conscious if you can do everything just as well fast asleep. When man first appeared on Earth, he was basically an animal, which meant that he was living in a perpetual kind of present moment. He was merely responding to things that went on around him. A point came where, for no reason that we understand, what scientists now call the brain explosion occurred. It occurred half a million years ago, and there appears to be no reason for it whatsoever. If you examine human tools and all this kind of thing going on for the next quarter of a million, four hundred thousand years, there's no sign of any advance in human tools. It wasn't the fact that man somehow needed to master something more complex that produced the brain explosion. And yet, from that time, a half million years ago, which in biological terms is nothing, nothing whatever, it's like yesterday, we've suddenly developed from apes into real human beings. And what's more, the first real human beings, in the sense that we're now sitting together in this room, developed a mere 50,000 years ago. It's preposterous. Something was driving evolution forward that we appear to know nothing whatever about. Now, what seems to have happened, and is for me the really puzzling thing, is that at a certain point, this new type of man who was born about 50,000 years ago called Cro-Magnon Man, began to develop powers which none of his predecessors had possessed. Certain powers of imagination. Certain powers of understanding other times and other places. Arnold Toynbee's glimpse, Proust's glimpse, what I call faculty X, the ability to recreate in the mind other times and other places. And yet, in a sense, he made no use of this whatever until, apparently, around about 500 BC, when we suddenly get, you know, the real human beings like Plato and Aristotle and Thales and so on, appearing on the scene of civilization. These people who actually thought for the pure fun of it. You, know, you remember it um, in the symposium, Socrates is going along to a banquet and then he suddenly stands in the middle of the square and just stands there. And then someone says, oh yes, well when Socrates was a soldier, he once did that for 24 hours. He was trying to think about a problem. He just stood there in the middle of the camping site and thought, now this is an absurdity. No creature had ever done this before. Stood still and thought, just for the fun of thinking. And then, of course, another thing had happened at the same time. The Greeks had invented the drama. They'd had these ancient poems and so on of Homer. They suddenly had the idea of making human beings stand around on a stage with a mask over their face and repeat them as if they were individual human beings in the poem, instead of one minstrel sitting there and just reciting the whole poem. And you can see that this, in fact, brings a completely new sense of reality to the whole thing. You may know Homer intimately, but when you see Achilles standing on one side of the stage and Hector standing on the other side of the stage, 
then you just suddenly get more involved. Imagination. The imagination got involved. And then, after centuries in which nothing happened, history appeared to go backwards, in which, you know, Greek civilization was destroyed, Roman civilization took over, and was absolutely stupid and militaristic, and produced no kind of new intellectual learning at all. And then the Arabs invaded Europe, little by little, intellectual learning came back into Europe. And suddenly, in the late Middle Ages, we once again begin to develop the play. And in England, it really comes to birth in the Elizabethan drama, where instead of having these static Greek figures reciting myths, you have people inventing plays of their own, and the whole thing, once again, is enacted before you. But it's enacted on a bare stage, with almost no scenery, and with boys playing the part of girls. In other words, it's still to a large extent ritual. You are intended to use your own imagination to fill in the gaps. Then, once again, nothing happens for two centuries. And then, in 1740, something rather strange happens. A man called Samuel Richardson writes the first novel. He was a printer who was asked to produce a kind of do-it-yourself volume about um, how to write letters. And Samuel Richardson started doing this and then got completely carried away by it and produced a novel called Pamela, written in the form of letters, which was about a maidservant whose master's wife dies and who says to her, um, don't worry, she's the master's, uh, the, uh, the ex-mistress's uh, special servant, don't worry, you can stay on and look after me, then spends the rest of the novel trying to get her into bed. And uh, the novel goes on for an enormous length. Dr. Johnson once said that anybody who read Richardson um, for the sake of the plot would go insane. <laughs> but it was obviously the fact that this wicked squire is pursuing Pamela and leaping out of cupboards on her and so on, and that Pamela finally virtuously um, marries the wicked squire that made this the subject of sermons and so on and made it the most popular thing in Europe. You know, before 1740, the most popular form of literary entertainment had been sermons. Any parson who produced a volume of sermons could reckon on having a bestseller. And parsons who were particularly good at <coughs> sermons became extremely rich. Lawrence Stern, for example, the author of Tristram Shandy, made far more from his sermons than he did from Tristram Shandy. What Samuel Richardson had done, in a sense, was to show people that once you relax into your imagination, you can be carried away on a kind of magic carpet. That relax deeply enough inside yourself, forget your surroundings, begin to create this inner world of the imagination and quite suddenly, like Aladdin opening a great stone slab in the ground, you go down into some strange inner world which is as real as the external world. And quite suddenly the novel became the most important form of entertainment in Europe. There were suddenly novels all over the place, um, Rousseau's New Heloise, became such a bestseller that libraries, which by then, in 1760, um, had already begun to flourish, were able to lend it out by the hour. Kant, who always went out on his walk like clockwork every day, so people in Königsberg could tell the time as he walked past, the only day when he missed it was when he was reading Rousseau's New Heloise, Rousseau's New Heloise. the novel became the most important imaginative experience that the world has ever had. In a certain sense, the human race took an enormous step forward with the Greek drama and an equally enormous leap forward with the discovery of the novel.
you know, there had been novels in the past, things like Don Quixote and so on, but they'd just been collections of old tales and anecdotes. There'd never been something that really got you all involved and reading for page after page after page to find what happened next. This has been one of the most important discoveries of the human race, and you can see that it's very closely related to Toynbee, to Faculty X. Now, there's another interesting thing that I must go into as a... How, how much longer have I got? Well, it'll take me about five more hours. I'll, I'll, I'll shorten this. <laughs> An American professor called Julian Jaynes has produced a very peculiar theory about the evolution of man. Jaynes believes that before about 1200 BC, man did not possess what we now call self-consciousness. If you now want to decide whether you're going to return home by one route or another, you think which are the advantages of either route, and you ask yourself. According to Jaynes, People before about 1250 BC could not look inside themselves because there was nothing there. And he thinks that this is closely connected with the two sides of the brain. James looked at ancient literature, for example, you know, Homer, um, Hesiod, the um, ancient epics, the Bible, and came to the conclusion that these ancient people heard voices when they intended to take a decision. Something from elsewhere told them what to do. That there's no evidence that they could look inside themselves and say, now what do, shall I do? Because they had no I. They were looking outwards all the time. And according to James, this is perfectly commonplace. For example, if you're a pianist and you start thinking about the piano, you'll play very badly. You know, the story about the centipede and somebody said, you know, how do you use your legs when you walk? And it tried to think about it and it fell on its nose. In a sense, not having consciousness is a great advantage. Now, according to James, self-consciousness appeared in the world quite suddenly after the great explosion of Santorini in about... 1450 BC, you know, this island in the Mediterranean, which suddenly exploded and almost destroyed Greek civilization. And also, after the invasion of some people, we now call the Sea Peoples, who poured into the Mediterranean. Now, I must confess, I, I've corresponded with Jaynes a great deal, and we've talked about this, and I've basically disagreed with him about this notion. He he's explained it in a book called The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And what he means by that, by the bicameral mind, is that the mind has two halves, two people living inside your brain. And he thinks that in these ancient people, the voices came out of the stranger in the other side of the head. Mozart was always saying that tunes walked into his head fully fledged. What he meant, obviously, was that tunes suddenly came walking out of his right brain into the part where Mozart lived, into the personal part of the brain. James thinks that this happened to these ancient people and that actually voices told ancient man what to do because he had no self-consciousness. Now, this seems to me to be a mistake. I think the explanation is more simple, although I think James has stumbled upon something of terrific importance and is, in a sense, holding it upside down. I have noticed, you know, in my studies of the so-called occult, that animals appear to have peculiar <coughs> paranormal powers which human beings do not possess. So that, for example, the dog belonging to a Scottish poet called Hugh McDermid, whom I knew, always knew when he was coming back from a long journey. He went and sat at the end of the lane for two hours, or two days rather, before he came back. His wife always knew when he was coming back. And he told me that on one occasion, the dog knew before he did, when he was returning unexpectedly from a visit. <laughs> now, 
you can see that that faculty has no use whatever. I mean, the dog just went and sat there for two days. It didn't do it any good. <laughs> and so, I believe that we all possess, basically, this animal faculty, which is a kind of oneness with the universe, which allows us to know things by some intuitive method, and that at a certain point in our evolution, in other words, what I'm saying is that Julian James's idea that the mind was originally bicameral, two completely separate rooms a mile apart, and that we then, so to speak, became at a certain point unicameral, is untrue. I think it's the other way around. We all began, like that dog, with a sense of oneness with the universe. <coughs> Walt Whitman once said that he envied the cows because, you know, they were able to stand around in fields indefinitely and chomp away contentedly at the grass and apparently felt none of our human discontents. I realize that the reason for this is that whenever I'm slightly drunk, which is moderately frequently, I get a sort of more or less lovely, happy feeling of oneness with the universe and that, in fact, when on one occasion Aldous Huxley persuaded me to take one of the psychedelic drugs called mescaline, I immediately experienced such an enormous feeling of oneness with the universe that I felt almost as if I'd blended into the universe itself. I felt as if I was on a sort of gently rocking sea on a kind of raft. And yet, it had one enormous disadvantage. I couldn't concentrate. Normally, I've got a pretty good mind. If I've got to write a review, I can read a book right through in the morning, I can write the review in the afternoon and get it knocked off like that. You know, I can concentrate my mind like, like a searchlight beam. And if I get really interested and excited, then suddenly my excitement makes the searchlight beam concentrate even closer, so it turns into a kind of laser. And this is when I do my best work, when my mind seems to cut through some intellectual substance and produce something that was not there before. Under mescaline, I was sort of like this. And no matter how hard I tried to get my mind together, I just couldn't. I just couldn't concentrate. I was in this wonderful wide open state in which I felt this exquisite, in which I felt this exquisite feeling of oneness with the universe. Also, incidentally, I live in a sort of little village in Cornwall called Goran Haven. I had a very strong feeling that the whole area was associated with witchcraft. And I've never bothered to check this up since, so there's no way of checking it. Um, I felt I knew things that I shouldn't know, that just came floating into my brain from elsewhere, so to speak. I was like a radio set, picking up 20 stations at the same time. But this is a... this is not a good state for a radio set, because you want to hear one station at a time. You know, we've developed this VHF, and my mind has developed a VHF, which picks up just one station at a time and concentrates like mad, when I need to concentrate. Under mescaline, I couldn't do this at all. I felt, you know, like a person with a large Alsatian dog putting its paws on your shoulders and licking your face. You know, I just wanted to push the damn thing away. I hated it. I was in this condition of universal love and I loathed it. <laughs> and I suddenly realized that our purpose is to get our minds together like that. That's the purpose. And animals are like this all the time. And just as human beings are when they're drunk. A cow's so contented in a field because it's drunk. Most animals are permanently drunk. <laughs> and we've actually succeeded in doing this with our minds. Now, that for me is the really fascinating thing. You see, the clue lay in this business of the right and the left brain. As a writer, I've always understood this instinctively, even long before I found out that we possessed two peoples inside our heads. Because, when I was a young writer, I would try to pour my ideas um, into, into words, and I'd feel, my God, that's good. Then I'd wake up the next morning, and it was dead. It, it looked stupid. It was as if I'd squashed all my feelings all over the page like dead flies. And 
When this has happened again and again, you get a feeling of terrific discouragement. You feel that trying to turn intuitions into words is a completely self-defeating practice, that it just, just cannot be done. And then, because you're a writer, you keep on doing it obsessively, and one morning you wake up and it's still there. You've captured it. Even if briefly, like a scent caught in a bottle with such a tight glass stopper that it hasn't escaped. And once you know you can do it, once you know you can throw up the intuitions from the right brain and catch them with the left brain and turn them into words, because that is the purpose of the two different halves of the brain. The right brain is an artist and the left brain is a scientist. The right brain is concerned with pattern recognition and intuitions. The left brain is concerned with language and logic. And that's you. And the other person, the intuitive person, the artist, is a total stranger. We've separated ourselves from the artist, from that intuitive person with the oneness with the universe. And I would discover that in certain moods, I would begin to turn ideas into words, and it was like a kind of tennis match. It was as if, as soon as I did this, my left brain would turn some intuition into words, and the right brain would say, yes, that's what I meant. And the, right would, uh, the left would say, oh, really? Thank you very much. And, and would catch the next intuition even better and turn that into words even better. And suddenly, you've got a kind of enthusiastic tennis match going on between the two sides of the brain. The tennis match we call inspiration. And you realize that this is what you're after, and that that's the trouble with us in the 20th century, we're living in the left half of the brain. And we've separated ourselves completely from that person living in the other half of the brain. You see, an another thing they discovered about the right and left brain was that the right brain goes far slower than the left. The artist goes far slower than the scientist. Your left brain, because it's coping with the problems of your everyday life, is always in a hurry. Your right brain strolls along whistling with its hands in its pockets, completely happy and relaxed. And so they're like two people going for a walk, and one's walking very fast and the other's walking very slow, and they can't really hold a conversation because, you know, they'd have to shout. Now, the thing is that in these moods I'm speaking of, when suddenly the two halves of the brain get into a kind of synchrony, you have an immediate communication between them, like two trains on parallel tracks running at exactly the same speed so the passengers can lean out of the window and talk to one another. These are the times when we really know ourselves. You know, when I was a small boy, we used to play a kind of game in which you stood by with your hands by your sides and fell backwards into the arms of someone who was waiting behind you. But it, it was very hard to do because you didn't really trust that he'd catch you. And this is exactly like that. When you know that that other person is there waiting to catch you, then you relax and really let yourself go. And we have totally forgotten that there's another person there. We're living trapped in the left half of the brain. Except in these odd moments, the peak experiences, when we suddenly feel happy. Now you can see why when Maslow's students began talking and thinking about peak experiences, they began having peak experiences all the time. Because they knew that other person was waiting to catch them. It's that peculiar tennis match between the two halves of the brain. Or, in another sense, you could compare them to two lumberjacks at either end of a double-handed saw. As soon as both of them grasp it and start working, this is the way it's supposed to work. Normally, just one of them is trying to work away. And, you know, my studies of so-called occult and paranormal convince me that, you know, it's nothing more than that. It's simply the fact that animals already possess this odd capacity because they have a unicameral mind. We have this bicameral mind. Incidentally, there's something very interesting. And I've got to shut up in a moment. What, how long can I go on for? Uh, let me just go on for ten more minutes. Mm -hmm. Animals possess this unicameral mind, and human beings appear to possess a bicameral mind. And one of the consequences, according to Julian James, and here I'm convinced he's totally correct, 
One of the consequences is the, the existence of cruelty in the human species. I can see no historical evidence whatever for deliberate cruelty before about 1400 BC. I've looked very carefully and I wrote to Jaquetta Hawkes, who was a historian of sort of the early Egyptians and so on, and I said, can you see anything? And she wrote back to me and said, well, there's a, this t tablet of, I've forgotten his name now, which shows the Egyptian king actually um, hacking off the heads of his prisoners and all the rest of it. But when I actually look at this, it shows nothing of the sort. It shows the prisoners with their heads bowed, and it shows the king with his fist raised above them in the attitude of a boxer, congratulating himself on his victory. No evidence whatsoever of cruelty. The first evidence of cruelty begins to appear after about 1200 BC, as recently as that. Quite suddenly, among the Assyrians, for example, you get these atrocious um, carvings that you find in the basement of the British Museum. They're even kept in the basement because they're so appalling of people being impaled and babies, you know, being uh, ripped to pieces and so on. It does appear that cruelty appeared in human history quite unexpectedly after man had become, so to speak, bicameral, once he'd become trapped in his left brain, and you can see why that is. Whenever you're bored and fed up and so on, you want to do something violent, because doing something violent gets you out of it. And this explains our rise in violent crime. This explains our rise in completely pointless crimes. James cites a stele of an Assyrian king who always in earlier carvings had been sitting beside the god because they believed that the king was a god in this stele, dated 1150 BC, the king is kneeling in front of the empty throne of the god. There's also a poem dated from this time that says something like, um, his mind is full of tension and headache. For the first time, this tremendous tension begins to occur because human beings were suddenly trapped. Why were they suddenly trapped? Because... Before that, civilization had been easygoing, like village life. There'd been no real problems. All of the early civilizations had come together um, as little groups around a temple and had been basically religious civilizations. And this had been true um, right throughout the second millennium BC. And then quite suddenly, the development of cruelty, because life has suddenly become atrociously complicated, and as soon as life becomes complicated, you've got to turn your mind from a vague, wide-open, cow-like state into that narrow precision. And as soon as you turn the mind into that narrow precision, you also become capable of losing your temper, as I do with my children when they interrupt me when I'm writing. We just become more irritable because there's more force compressed into that narrow compass. This is the reason that human beings appear to have become destructive and I'm totally convinced that James is right in this particular thing. Now, as I say, you can see then the essence of this problem. I've tried to present a sort of overall picture of the problem of what has happened to human beings and the way that we've developed. And you can see that the problem is quite simply that as you are now listening to me, to some extent your right brain is participating and grasping intuitively what I'm saying, but mainly your left brain is doing the listening and taking in. And that if you become bored, your right brain will participate less and less. They discovered, um, for example, that if you take the brain waves of a person doing something that bores him, his right brain begins to produce sleep rhythms. It literally goes to sleep. Now, you can see that the main problem is the fact that the two halves of the brain go at different <coughs> speeds. The right, as I said,